Good evening, everyone. Am I loud enough? Can you hear me? Okay, great. My name is Leah Simbalakis. I'm the planning project manager. Today from the city, we have myself and Sean Mendron, senior planner. I hope everybody got a chance to pick up an agenda in the back and then also sign in. So it's important to have your email and make sure we can keep in touch with you as the process goes along. So really quickly, I'm going to review the agenda and then I'm going to get the team get right into it. So I um, wanted to, if you turn your agenda to the back, I want to remind you all how we kind of got here. If you notice, on the back we have the overall, what we call the Japantown Courtyard site. It was rezoned in December 2015 for, and it has several components. We have two residential towers which are being um, built, or are being not built yet, but will be built by Related. And then we have the CCA building on the north side of the project. And then we also have the park. The park is part of Related's obligation to the city. So tonight we're really only going to talk about the CCA, but together all of these components create the Japantown Courtyard site. So I just wanted to remind you what component we are working on tonight. So I'm then going to, uh, first I'm going to introduce Connie Martinez, the CEO of uh, SV Creates. But before I do that, quickly we're going to have a presentation and then I put under next steps, answer questions in a review activity. It's not really an activity. What we want to do is if there's general questions for the city, we would answer them as a group, but then we really want you to go to the boards. Um, there's going to be team, uh, members from the architectural team there so you can get a real feel of what's happening rather than having to look at it on the screen and you can get some more individual attention. So it's not an activity per se, it's just, um, I called it activity. Um, so I'm now going to bring Connie up and she's going to introduce the team. Yeah. I need a little inspiration behind me, so we're going to get the screen back up. So thank you, Leah, and all of the planning team. It's been great working with you guys. Um, Connie Martinez, and I am so delighted to be here. We're so excited to share our designs for the Creative Center with you tonight. Um, part of my job is to introduce the team that's been working on this, and I liken it somewhat to a barn raising, community barn raising. So there's, um, you know, it kind of takes a village to, to build a creative center, and there have been so many people involved and so many nice faces and familiar faces in the room that have helped us along the way. So first of all, let me introduce Roy here by Ashi. Where are you, Roy? Okay, Roy is going to um, also present with me in a few minutes. We're co-chairs of the steering committee that has driven the, the planning of this um, of the creative center over the last three and a half years. Okay, <laughs> three and a half years. Okay, so Roy will be coming back up in a second. Um, and then our partners. We have two equity partners that have been by our sides from the very beginning and um, will have this as their permanent home. Of course, San Jose Tyco is part of that, and um, Lisa's back there. Is Franco here yet? Yeah. Not yet. So um, that whole team and board members, I see some board members there, and then Create TV. Chad Johnston, where are you? I just saw you. Oh, there you are, Chad. And your board, do you have a few board members here? Sure, okay, sure. great, great, great. Uh, so those, those are the three, along with SV Creates, we're the three equity partners that have done most of the, the detailed planning and um, uh, funding the, and added funding to the project. So let's see, the steering committee members, Jerry, you were already introduced, but you're part of our steering committee. Our board chair, Jane Decker, where are you, Jane? There you are. Um, let's see, I don't see, um, Wies, or I do see Wiesa, Teresa and Natalie aren't here yet, so I may, these are two other board members that have been part of it, Teresa Alvarado and Natalie Engels. Okay, then there's our architects. So you're going to hear a lot from, from Jason Roberts, but we also have Emily Jones and Mia Allen on that team. They're from Ankrum Moisson, so we've had a, a lot, we've worked hard along the way and we're really excited where we landed. So thank you. And then Jason Victor of Ken K and Associates. And as um, Leah said, this is not about the park tonight, but you can't really understand the design of our building unless you also see how it's integrated with the park. So we are going to touch on that design as well. And then you have to have strong construction managers to drive us on to completion. And that group is Dennis McCoy and Susie Kallenbeck from Nova Partners. So lastly, and on our SD Creates team, Alexandra Urbanowski. Many of you know her. She's the project lead, Alexandra. 
And then Dean Osaki is a new member of our team, so he's working closely with us as well. Um, back to the community barn raising, we've worked closely with the Japantown Community Congress. I know, Helen, you're there. Any other members for the Japan? Okay. Um, the Japantown Business Association, Spur San Jose, and the many local businesses and residents. So you, you get the picture, it's barn raising time. And then, of course, the city of San Jose. So our mayor and our council member, um, Ra Ra um, Raul Perales, has been very helpful along the way, and we've enjoyed working with all the city staff. So with that, I want to touch a little bit on the vision that we have. This shouldn't be new to most of you. Um, and oh, you know what? Can you see? Almost like it needs to be lower. Anyway, those three, the three um, words across the top of this are community, engagement, and creativity. And these are the values that we defined early on. And essentially, every decision we've made in the design process has taken to that into account. But they go very much with our three driving goals for the project. This is important for the community to understand and hopefully to be proud of and excited about. And they are, we want to provide permanent, affordable space to at least a segment of our arts ecosystem and create a shared <coughs> service center for the entire ecosystem. So this is a, a huge project that will serve our, our Silicon Valley arts and culture and especially San Jose and a permanent home for San Jose Petco, okay? So we also want to honor the cultural heritage of this site. This site has a very rich heritage. Um, Roy's gonna touch on that a bit, but that's part of our goal is we wanna honor its cultural heritage and certainly add vibrancy to Japantown. So those are the three goals with these values that have driven every um, decision we've made. I want to remind folks that this is not a performance space. This is to house the creators of the arts, the makers of the arts, rehearsal space offices, and that we will also have classroom space and meeting space for the community and the local neighborhood. We have some tenants that have already signed up, and by the way, Ultimately, we see a couple of dozen arts organizations that will be housed here. This will be their home, and then many, many other using the services. But some of those that are with us tonight, I'll give you a preview of some that have already signed up, but there's literally a couple dozen in the, in the works. Um, we have, um, of course, San Jose Tycho, 3TV, San Jose Jazz, New Ballet School, um, Los Lopenos, and Empire 7. Those are just a few. And San Jose Dance. And San Jose Dance, right in front of me, Gary. <laughs> so those are the ones that are here tonight that I see in the crowd. And um, but like I said, there are many more. So it's very, very important. So now, Roy, if I could ask you to come up and just touch on the community benefits side before sure. we continue. Well, thank you, Connie. Um, just a little bit of background so that everyone knows that um, this project or this property actually has been in the works for the community for a really long time. Um, as many of you probably know, especially if you've lived in the neighborhood for a long time, it's basically called their corporate yard, where the city was doing a lot of their maintenance work for their, their vehicles. And so the city has really owned this property for all this time since basically World War II on to uh, more recently. Um, but it's been right in the middle of Japan town, basically. And so what we've been uh, trying to do for quite a while is to get the city and actually to move off and then to do something different there with that property. And so uh, in line with this also is actually San Jose Taiko, which has been existing here in this community since 1973. We've always been looking to try to create a, a rehearsal place or a place for us to do our work in, in Japan town. So we've been kind of moving around quite a bit over the years, but this is an opportunity for us now to come back. This, this property actually, the community has been looking at it since about 1985 to really kind of do something more permanently other than what was there by the city. And so that's actually when it really started some discussion about how to move what was there currently, what was there before, to what you know, we could do in the future. And it's gone to, as uh, uh, some of you may know, to very many, uh, very many different situations as far as developers. And this is actually uh, the third developer that has kind of come on board since we've really been working on it since that period of time. So we're really kind of excited now that it's been moving along within that context within within that period of time since 
some early discussions in 85 to some real uh, permanent things when the city moved off and um, I believe they moved off the property in 1989 and that first developer that was assigned that, that brought, was brought on was the Olson Company in 2006. So as you know, these things take a long time and so some of us have been here doing that, trying to do this for quite a while and we're very excited to where it's going. As Connie mentioned, Really, what's important for us, though, is, uh, is the cultural heritage where Japantown is and what it means for us. And as you may know, that property actually is original China, Chinatown, or what was called Highlandville. And so it's really important that we honor that fact. But around uh, Chinatown, which started in the late uh, in the 1890s or so, uh, Japantown grew out of that. The Filipino community was, was, has been around this area. And many other cultural groups now are existing within our neighborhood that's very diverse. And so for, for us right now, I feel is what's really important is to really honor actually the history of what has gone on in this property, but also really it's important to look at what the future generations are going to be doing and can do. And so to build for the future is really important along with recognizing the history of the past of, the, of our neighborhood and Japantown itself. And so for us, it's really that combination of what this is all about and it's a very exciting opportunity to create that that art space, that cultural space, that really is going to move that forward for what we've been waiting for for a very, very long time. So I'd like to turn it back to Connie. Sure, I'm just here to introduce um, Jason again, so he'll walk through the journey we've been on and share the designs. Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk about the barn. Didn't realize it's it a barn. Bar. <laughs> it's a really, really nice barn. <laughs> um, one of my favorite things is these. Um, these values, there's not a lot of projects where you take an idea like this and run it through a building. And so our job has been to sort of believe in these things and try to figure out how to make architecture uh, that uh, facilitates these creativity and engagement community. So one of the first things, and I, we've shown this before, we, oops, there we go. Sorry. Um, so we have these values um, for the building itself that are complementing those values. Um, first of all, um, iconic architecture. We wanted to make sure this was an expressive building. It had a presence in the community, a strong presence. People know about it. People have a sense of pride. Um, it had a design quality, just like a building full of creativity. It needed to be designed with creativity. So we supported that. And then last of all, a really important part is we had this great um, complex of buildings here, two residential buildings and a park and the plaza park, and make sure those are all integrated and they become one almost seamlessly. So those have guided what we've done for the last year or so. Um, I think we showed these at the last, at the PD zoning, and I, and I think they still stand true as we move through the design here. I how to do this right now. <laughs> um, this is the diagram. Um, this is looking down in, from the sky and plan. Um, so what you see in the, met, the middle, the blue area, is like a, a representation of the floor plan of this building. The park sits on front. This is 6th Avenue. And then 7th back there. Um, and these are the two residential buildings that book in both the park and the CCA. And one thing we really want to make sure that these all tie together. So the park kind of it, it fronts the building and wraps around the edges. It's, it's almost like it's in the park. Um, Kim K's uh, group, Jason's going to come up. The other Jason's going to talk about the park later. But all that park is seamlessly connecting all these buildings together. And then a special part of it is called the Memory Walk, which has a lot to do with the history of this community that extends from the park directly into our building, which actually forms a small <coughs> courtyard, which welcomes you kind of almost like I would say it's sort of giving the park a hug, trying to hug the park, welcome you into the building. And then in the center of the building is a really um, special uh, space where people will meet and gather. Um, and it has on special occasions that can open up and you can actually go right into the building from the park. Um, and, that, and that is sort of the heart of what we call the creative thread, which is the spirit of this place, the creativity. And then it even goes all the way through through the seventh, and there's a there's a sort of an entry on seventh there. This is a section, so this is cut right through the park and the middle of that space I was just talking about. Um, you have Sixth Avenue on this end. You have the plaza uh, park area there, and then our courtyard is this area right 
right there, um, where it's kind of welcoming you in. And then you can see inside the building, there's a nice stair in there. And all the program, I'll go through that a little bit. And then you can see you go all the way through to 7th Avenue on the other side. A couple things that are, we're trying to do here to um, grab some of those ideas, engagement. Um, the rehearsal studios that you see up in, up, um, the rehearsal studios are, there's a lot of glass corners, so you'll, um, at the park, you'll be able to see people dancing and you know, playing or rehearsing up there, trying to see as much as you can of what's going on in this building. Um, at the end of the courtyard, that wall on special occasions can open up and just flow right in there. Um, and then last of all, the, the access terrace is a space we'll go into detail along 7th, which is kind of like a front porch. So a lot of people will come along 7th. There's where you can park and there's a street there. Um, you can hang out there. Um, there's a gallery at that level. I'm um, giving you a quick glimpse of what's going on on the inside. This is the ground floor. So we've, we've gone from that diagram I showed you and zoomed in. To this, the courtyard, the memory walks coming through the park right here. Into this is an outdoor courtyard. Uh, Tycho has their studio right here for rehearsing. And then Create TV is up in the far corner in the pink. They are, uh, they, both of those elements are interesting because they're, they, they are very solid um, building forms. We'll talk a little bit about materials, but it's hard to let light into those spaces because of acoustical considerations. Um, along the front here, we have shared rehearsal spaces that will be used by a lot of groups that are right in the park. Um, and then along the back where that blue line comes, along, uh, comes across, that is the, uh, the access terrace where you can walk in. It's kind of like a park front porch. It's raised up a little bit. There's planning and benches along that edge. And then two entries go into the building along that edge. And there's also uh, the Empire 7 gallery along that edge. There. Sure, I'm getting everything. Excuse me. Is there any performance space at all anywhere in the park or in the building? Um, the state, the courtyard raised a few steps, so it, interesting enough, you could probably create a performance there. I mean, it, it's sort of stage like. Um, we've also thought about how this building opens on a special occasion. You might be performing in the courtyard and, and reach through the building. It's fairly flexible that way. And then going back to what I was talking about a little bit, the building concept um, has been to play with um, these different forms. Um, there's, there's, on the top you see that there's these kind of glassier forms um, where we're, we have certain program elements that you can see into, um, light can get into, and then we have more solid masses um, represented down below. So we have this kind of play of these two concepts of um, you can see the top, the glassier studios. Um, we've also thought about at night, um, making sure it, like the, when the lights are on, it has this kind of nice backdrop with glowing presence on the park. It's very welcoming. Um, environmentally, um, using glass, you need to take care of heat gain. It's all been pretty hot here, I guess. Um, we're looking at these uh, thin elements that will shade the building. Um, we've been inspired by textures. That picture there is an interior of a Tyco drum. And uh, now that we're doing that, but even in our concrete work, we'll have a really um, textured pattern on that. That also kind of inspired by the rhythm of, of the music and things that happen, the dance moves in there. And then there's also a set of metal panels, which is similarly inspired um, to have rhythm and texture. And then here's what it looks like. Um, this is the barn um, yeah. along 7th Avenue. Um, street. 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 You're okay. <laughs> street. Street. Do you have 7th Avenue here? No. Okay. Yeah. 7th Street. Um, I want to just walk along this. This is a rendering of what you'd see if you were driving along 7th Street. Um, on this side here, you can see how the landscape comes around the edge and you can just walk through there into the park. That's the residential building on that side. It's a little bit taller than this building. This building's three stories and then it steps up a little taller because of dance studios on the upper floor. Then as you come along the base, this, this is the kind of porch area. It's raised up a couple feet 
with plantings and benches. Um, you can hang out there. The um, gallery along there has a roll up glass door. So on a special occasion, uh, maybe a, a new opening, Empire 7 can open those doors and people can just have a, a very open event um, on there. And then right in the middle there is uh, the main entry um, to, the, to the creative space in there. Um, material wise, um, actually I'll just keep going. And then there's um, Crate TV is where the concrete shows up. And once again, you can walk around the other edge of the building. Similar space to the, uh, the tree line space over there and walk along that edge in between the apartments and the building. Um, along the base we have metal panels, the dark metal panels, and those we showed you have, a, they, have a, they kind of go in and out and they have different widths and they sort of play with rhythm and light and they'll have a lot of interest during the sun will, the sun will have different shadow lines on them. Um, and then along there we have a, it, it's not exactly wood, it's a, it's a hybrid type material that we found. It's got the warmth of wood that'll be along the edge. It lasts longer, it doesn't turn gray after a few years. And so that'll really warm up the edge down there as you get to the entry. And then the textured concrete happens as you go over here. Above that is the metal panel and that's all kind of um, laid out, um, be inspired by rhythm and then allowing light into different spaces. There's a lot of um, office functioning meeting facilities on this side and then where it raises up, the building sort of steps up, that's where the dance, dance studios are with the extra height. And um, zooming into those materials, this is just taking a, a closer look at all the materials we're using. The upper materials are the more transparent ones that you can see in the building. You can see the vertical fins and like I said, those will look nice. They're actually painted a warm contrasting color to the metal and they provide nice shade so when it gets hot you don't get as much heat in the building. Um, the middle is called a fritted glass panel. It's a pattern on the glass so you can actually see into the space but it'll be kind of muted. Um, you'll see shadows and things. It provides a little shading and a little bit of contrast to the, to the really clear uh, curtain wall glazing we're using for a lot of the building. Uh, down below is the solid materials we're using. It's called board form textured concrete. Basically, you use boards to create a lot of texture when you're pouring the concrete. Um, we also have smooth concrete and then the metal panels. You can see some of the rhythm that's played up with the metal panels on the building. And this is the uh, Parkside view. So um, you're in the plaza here. Um, we have this great wall where we'll have murals. Uh, it'll be smooth concrete and murals can be painted on there and changed and uh, I imagine um, that'll be pretty exciting to see. Um, the courtyard in the middle there um, and that actually shows that you can see how light it is that the doors are open and there's a special occasion of people are just flowing in and out. The memory walks coming along on the red brick path into the building. Um, dance studios up in the upper corner there. With, uh, which will, will be actually pretty nice at night when the lights are on, you can see them dancing up in there. And another thing um, I wanted to point out, that, so the, the Tyco space, we, we worked hard to try to get the building to step up and have a nice, the, the apartment buildings be a little taller and this building kind of steps down and sort of comes and connects to the park stronger. Um, I think that's all I have. Jason's going to come in up and talk a little bit about the park. Hi, Jason. Where are you, Jason? <laughs> the, the other Jason. <laughs> <laughs> Jason. Thanks. So I'm going to actually move this forward. Okay, well, uh, for us, um, as part of the, the team, uh, we had a, an incredibly uh, rewarding experience in uh, working with this community in particular to get through the visioning process uh, that has led us to where we are. I was going through some dates uh, with the team today. It's hard to believe that it's been over a year since we've been in front of you all with, uh, in particular, the Parks presentation uh, that we went through last. That was in March of last year. Uh, since that time, we had gone through a Parks Commission meeting uh, where we took all the feedback that we received from the community, uh, which was a lot of support uh, and a lot of great uh, comments that we were able to work back through. 
um, and got a very favorable reaction from the Parks Commission uh, in, in setting the table for the design for the park. And which, in particular, that, that lower half of the site, that three quarter acre uh, part of the land, um, as Connie said, you can't talk about the CCA building and the Creative Center for the Arts without talking about the park. It is one cohesive uh, expression of design in which uh, the forms, the materials, the plant material, uh, the focus on uh, public use, uh, all of those things flow from one space to the next. Um, and I think you know, Jason did a, a very good job of covering how a lot of these pieces are, are interrelated. Um, but I think some of the important things that we just wanted to touch on in particular, uh, which were incredibly important aspects that came through uh, the, the vision process and the design of where we, where we are today. Um, the idea of, this, of the community thread, uh, I mean, it was, it was incredibly clear to us the first time we took a site walk in the district, looked at the property, uh, look at the opportunity here, the, the heritage and culture of this place, uh, and I think importantly, the uh, some of the and some of the boards that we have in the back are. Oh, my battery's not low. I mean, uh, some of the boards that we have off to the side are not in this presentation, but they're they're important information to serve as some of the underpinnings of what we went through uh, to come up with the the parks design as it stands. Place marking, place keeping, one of our, our you know, terms planners throw around a lot, and they're important, but place keeping is really the thing that, that came to us, right? This place has a character, uh, it has a very unique experience and vibe in San Jose in particular. So how do we make sure that those things are represented in the park? Uh, in particular, the history of the site in the district, uh, it, it, one of the main items, the memory trail, what is it that links the park and the CCA building and the experience of past and future um, is that line. That line is intended to be a, a very important line in the ground. It's an idea made of uh, brick uh, to signify some of the, the past materials that were used on the site uh, uh, in days gone by. Uh, with importance, and it's a little bit hard to see in this, in this image, but there are little yellow dots kind of along that trail. That's, that, those are the historic medallions, the storytelling piece. What is the culture? What is the story of the site? It's the story of the district? Those things work their way through the park uh, and culminate in a storytelling piece about maybe what's the future, right? Technology grows, art changes. As we get from past to present, that's supposed to be the tie between making these two spaces read uh, and be one cohesive statement about, uh, about creativity and art and how it's, how it's used. Importantly, in the park itself, um, rich materials, detailing, uh, appropriate plant material for not only our climate, but for the cultural aspects that are here. All of those things were thought about in very uh, high level of detail. Um, we've had a lot of great uh, collaborative discussions with the Parks Department, with uh, other departments from, from the city staff uh, that made our way through understanding that where we wanted to go with this uh, was going to be a great uh, asset for not only the district, but for the city itself. And we were able to extend those materials, uh, extend the forms, extend the types of plant materials we're going to be using uh, to make one uh, full cohesive statement with, with the, uh, the Center for the Arts. The south and north gardens um, are where uh, access happens between the scenes, between the residential property of uh, related efforts and, and the, uh, the site for the Creative Center for the Arts itself. Um, a lot of the use space inside the park is really passive space. It's flexible for use, but you can do a lot of things. Um, the idea of seating areas, shaded areas to get uh, out of the fray, um, outdoor use spaces, which things that you see on the side of the building over here, um, uh, creative uh, breakout spaces for the uses inside the building, uh, seating areas as they work their way up, that those little forms kind of on that north garden tag. Uh, I think very important, the, uh, the district benches, uh, I think were an important part, and I know you, you know exactly the ones I'm talking about throughout uh, 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 the, uh, throughout the district. There's a lot of opportunity to, to house a lot of what is left in storage and also extend those up through uh, through those north and south gardens as well. Um, so again, taking those, taking the intent of the park, uh, taking the materials, taking the quality, and extending it through. And I think Jason did a very good job, the other Jason, 
uh, did a very good job in explaining the relationships of the courtyard, that entry courtyard in the center. That, uh, that really is, I think when Ken sat down and did his first big crayon doodle of what this concept is, that spot right there was the ripple in the pond. And you can kind of see how those forms kind of emanated and, and radiated themselves to now uh, on the, the doorstep of now taking this even further from, uh, from the visioning process and now in this process of moving closer to implementation. So, uh, Connie's going to come up now and answer any questions you have. And, and, uh, We're trying to. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> we have time for a few questions, and then I think we're going to break up into smaller areas where you can speak directly to the, the folks in charge of that. But let's start with some questions. Are you able to talk about timelines at all? So the, the plan is, is to break ground within a, about a year, about a year from now. And are then, we well, we're following. We want to follow related, and their PD permit, as I understand, is break ground within a year. They go next spring. We follow. That's the that's the idea. Did I get that right, Alexander? Yeah. Um, you're talking about our building, and that's our building would be break ground next year. But that's the the current timeline. And then there's 18 months to two years for construction. Did I get that right? Construction team? Fingers <laughs> crossed. <laughs> yes. So with the plan of the building, which is a beautiful building, what do you do with the drainage? And since, especially since we just went through the whole flood, what's going to happen to that so that, that all of that beautiful building and the plan to the signs don't get burned by water? So what's your, do you have a, a water a irrigation plan? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So I guess, and I wish I, well, my, I apologize, my laser pointer died on me just as I started to test it before I ever, but we can talk about this plan. So these two spaces right here, one in the North Garden and then one in the South Garden, are called uh, bioretention areas for stormwater in particular. So the entire roof area for, for the CCA drains to those two locations to get filtered to make their way into the stormwater system. So that's a requirement that needs to happen, but when, when your facilities are built specifically for that purpose, um, you, can, you can help uh, alleviate some of the issues that, that you're bringing up. The rest of the site as well, uh, that in, in smaller increments, are, are doing a lot of the same things. There's smaller areas where water's being collected and treated before it makes its way into the, into the stormwater system. Oh, so that, that's happening. Okay. And then irrigation is pretty much a slam dunk. You gotta be, you gotta be very water efficient with the delivery system. Be very smart about which plants you pick to serve the function that you're trying to do. But that's 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 the story of how we designed it. Okay, thank you. How about the parking? <laughs> I'll take, I'll take the parking question. Um, so when the project was approved by council in December, they approved 40 spaces for commercial use, 20 of which are exclusively reserved for the CCA. And so this building will have 20 sp parking spaces specifically just for them. When the commercial spaces aren't in use, there'll be an additional 20 spaces. Um, the goal is that it's really a neighborhood attraction. People won't need their cars, so we don't anticipate a lot of cars coming to the site, um, but when they do, there is parking and it will be provided in the related building, underground. So they're not, they're not saying that they're going to use those so 40, you're not using anything on the street, correct? I'm sorry? Uh -huh. The 40 that you're saying are not using any of the street parking. Right. There'll be 40 of spots contained within the related building. Is um, that'll be reserved for the CCA. <laughs> but but it, wouldn't staff take essentially the, that 40? Because you're going to have people coming in from different um, different groups to come. I think, I think it'll be a mix, but the you know the bigger picture is we could have left this courtyard site as a giant parking lot. We want to bring other amenities, and we have to balance bringing uh, projects to areas where there is um, deficient parking because of older buildings, and is still being able to provide new opportunities. Parking to build parking is very expensive. Related has, has done a huge favor for the CCA by providing that parking in their building so that they can provide this great amenity to the community. Um, parking is congested in Japantown, we acknowledge that, but as projects we develop, there'll be more opportunity for people to park. I don't know if anybody from Empire Sevens here, your building is being torn down to be an apartment complex. So now those people who live in the area that move into that will probably have a parking spot, whereas some of the older apartment complexes don't have parking. So as the area redevelops, 
everybody has to take part in um, you know, solving the parking problem. One project alone isn't going to solve the lack of parking. They're doing their part by providing 20 spaces and then the rest of the amenities for the community. What hours is the park open to the public? They're typically open sunset, uh, sunrise to sunset. So in the winter, it'll be a little bit shorter. In the summer, it'll be longer. But those are typical city park hours. A couple more before we break into the smaller groups. So I, I know it's kind of an odd pass, but security and lighting, because the general security and lighting is very necessary. Yeah, I don't walk The park will be regulated by the city, and they'll have their lighting. Um, the, it's not going to be gated, um, but it's not. It's the residential components do have gates, but the park will be open like a normal park. It won't be gated, but they're patrolled by um, you know staff. So it's going to be well lit, you know. Hopefully, and and it'll be have a lot of activity now. So that, you know that discourages bad behavior, if you will. Hello, Kathy. Hi, hello. <laughs> so I'm going to show you the farm question. Um, and I know that there has been a lot of talk about it. There's a motion at the diagram, and I, I, I don't know, you know what those spaces actually are. So this might be a breakout question um, for a smaller group, but just um, what uh, the park was going to be able to accommodate the farmer's market, which at this point during the summer is maybe 12 to 15 vendors, but some of them have three or four, 10 foot, you know, they can take up 40 feet by 18 feet themselves. So, and there's one vendor, so I was wondering about that, load in, load out, all of those issues. So, that's a, yeah, that's a perfect question, and, and I agree with you, that is a, that is a, a breakout question that we definitely need to, to continue with that. The dialogue we started when we went through the parks design initially, the concept still is to allow this park to, to function with that, that use. It's an incredibly important part to the district. Uh, the diagram that you're speaking to uh, had the, uh, the tents themselves uh, within the park plaza and had the ability to get access to the park down the uh, circulation corridor against the south uh, residential uh, component. So we are, as the, the <coughs> process for the park continues, which we're not quite in yet, but I think we probably will be soon as all the momentum begins. Uh, those are one of the things in particular that, that we want to make sure that we get right with you in particular. So, so yes, that, that's high on our radar as well. So, is it time to break into smaller groups and join the various folks that you think you'd like to challenge or talk to? Or um, this is such a quiet group. <laughs> Did we get it right? I just want to say one thing on scheduling. So now that we've had this meeting, I'm. You can feel free to email me. My cards are in the back. Alexander's cards are in the back. And then the goal would be in about 30 days to schedule this for hearing. Um, we'll be getting, I'm, I'm assuming you all got this or maybe you posted somewhere. Um, but if you didn't receive it, we'll be going to, we'll be sending out notices for the public hearing. The plan development permit goes to director's hearing. So you'll be getting a notice that's a public opportunity to come again. If you don't feel like talking tonight, you can come to the meeting as well. But our team will stay for the next 20, 30 minutes to answer any questions that you might have. So thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>